Okay, uh, so today we're covering trees of South America. And as we look at a little bit of context here for South America, uh, the continent includes 13 countries, which cover 6.9 million square miles. Brazil alone is nearly half of that. It's 3.3 million square miles. And it's the fifth largest country in the world. Um, and Brazil itself is actually 10% larger than the contiguous United States. Um, so you've got a pretty vast land area. A lot of it is going to be areas near sea level, not unlike the southern coastal plain where we are right now. Um, they have lots of areas that are similar to Piedmont, kind of the foothills uh, to the Appalachian Mountains that we have here in the southern U.S. Uh, their highest mountains make it over 20,000 feet. And so those are going to be along the Andes on the West Coast, uh, which is really going to shape a lot of the climate, which shapes a lot of the range maps that we're going to look at. The soils are going to be pretty diverse, but what you're going to notice here, uh, this is a map of different soil orders. And so you'll see the red there covering the Amazon basin. Those are going to be our oxisols. And oxisols are very old, very heavily weathered soils. They weather in place. And so oxisols will actually weather so heavily that the clay will break down into iron and aluminum sesquioxides. So the clay even breaks down. And so because of that, you know, a cubic foot or a cubic meter of these soils may not be able to hold that much in the way of nutrition. So you commonly hear that if you harvest a rainforest, the soils are then infertile and nothing will grow back. That ends up actually being a gross over exaggeration because while a given unit volume of this soil may not be able to hold much in the way of nutrients, it's old and it's weathered in place. So some of these soils may be 100 feet deep. And we're talking about trees. So if trees have 100 feet of soil they can root into, they can usually find plenty of water and plenty of nutrients uh, in order to grow. Um, then you'll see throughout the, the rest of the continent, you have all, all the other soil orders. Uh, the green here is mollusols. Those are going to be prairie soils, so we're not going to have as many forests in that region. Um, ultisols are kind of this light orange color. That's a very common type of soil that we have right here in the southeastern United States. Yeah, Raven. How do you spell that? The, the, the red one, oxisol? O-X-I. SOLS. And you'll learn that in our soils course with Dr. Farish. So just linking dendro into soil. When we look at the climate, the Amazon basin, this region right here, is both very warm and very wet. And then as you start looking further south, uh, many expeditions to Antarctica will actually depart uh, from southern Chile. And so as you look further south, uh, it'll get increasingly cold. Um, and then you, what you see right here is the Andes Mountains really shaping the climate. At those high elevations, it's very cold. And the mountains will also create rain shadows uh, where you'll have regions of desert where you barely get any rain um, on one side of that mountain chain, typically the west side. And so that shapes the forest that we see. And so as you look, uh, the Andes on the west coast will have few forests. Uh, due to the deserts that they form and the high elevations above tree line. But then the Amazon basin there clearly has a lot of vegetation. What this figure is showing you is an enhanced vegetation index where basically just the greener it looks, the more vegetation you have. So, so that's going to shape where we find different trees. And here's the breakdown on the cover types. And now what you're noticing compared to Australia, it's much more diverse doesn't have one genus that's basically dominating the entire continent. But what you do see is lowland evergreen or broadleaf rainforest, 42%, semi-evergreen moist broadleaf forest, 23%, and then savannas, we have another 20% cover type. So more than about 80% of your cover types are split across those three with some other minor cover types that we'll talk about today. Some we've already discussed like mangrove, if you've seen one mangrove, you've seen them all, um, but others we'll get into more today. Okay, so this was the largest cover type, the lowland evergreen rainforest. And uh, let's look at a, a little broader perspective on this 
area. A recent paper came out uh, in 2016. What they did is they went through all the herbaria specimens they could find collected in the Amazon basin. Uh, so they had 300 years worth of research to draw upon. They had collections from 1707 up to 2015. And upon going through all those, they found 141 different families of trees. This is just trees. 1,226 genera and 11,676 species of trees. So the Amazon basin is incredibly diverse in terms of trees. And as they looked into this, their best guess is that we've only discovered about three quarters of the trees in the Amazon basin, meaning there's another approximately 4,000 species of trees as yet undiscovered in this region. And so to look at that and give you a little more context, if you learned 160 species a semester in Dendro and you wanted to learn all 11,000 plus species uh, that are currently known in the Amazon basin, you would have to take Dendro for 36 and a half years every semester, fall and spring. And that would get you to close to that 12,000 species. So uh, we'll do it a little bit quicker than that. Um, if you look at that paper, it's actually interesting. They've uploaded a spreadsheet that includes all the tree taxa that they observed. So what I did is I filmed a video of me scrolling through the spreadsheet. And so that's how we'll go ahead and uh, learn these 11,000 plus tree species. So you can see all the different families here. Some of them you're recognizing from lab, uh, Anonaceae, Clusiaceae, Fabaceae. So some of them are familiar, some of them less so but it's just an unbelievable diversity of forest trees. Still going, and there you go, 11,676. There's one title row at the top, so. So those will all be fair game for the next exam. Sound good? Okay, so uh, incredible diversity there. So we really can't get into it in a lot of great detail. Um, you might have research stations that are 10 acres in that region, and they're still finding new tree species. So just unbelievable. Um, let's look at a different cover type. This is going to be a drier area called the Thorn Forest or Katinga. Uh, remember, we're talking about the Southern Hemisphere here. So you flip the seasons between winter and summer from what we're used to here in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, they'll have hot, wet summers and hot, dry winters in this region. Soil surface temperatures can reach 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see we've got areas in Central Texas and parts of West Texas that, you know, may look kind of similar structurally to some of these ecosystems. So let's start with a few drier sited species. Um, this one's from a little bit of a different region. This is from the Atacama Desert in Peru in Northern Chile, but this is Candelabra cactus. So it's Cactaceae browningia candelaris. And with the cacti, cacti are very diverse, but most cacti that you'll observe will be knee high or shorter. They don't tend to be very tall. They don't tend to make it to the stature of a tree usually. Um, a few taxa do. Uh, one of you all will get to give a presentation on saguaro. Uh, this is a South American cactus that reaches similar stature to our North American saguaro. Um, but you can see it's the only thing growing around. The only other plants that'll grow in this incredibly arid area will be a few other species of cacti. And they have a host of adaptations to help them survive this extremely arid region. The stems are designed to store water. And so they actually have woody ribs running vertically up and down them. And it kind of works like an accordion where when it does rain and they are able to uptake water, uh, the stems can actually expand to hold and store that additional water. They're gonna have a shallow, very broadly distributed root system again, so they can collect rain because uh, when it rarely does fall, it's going to be gone pretty quickly. So they have to collect it while they can. Um, many of the cacti, including this one, uh, follow a different mode of photosynthesis, uh, what we call CAM photosynthesis. And that's going to be the Crassulacean acid metabolism. So the acronym for that is CAM. Um, and the idea there is water is their most limiting resource, not light. So they're fighting against losing water. And so they kind of break apart the two stages of photosynthesis. One part of photosynthesis is how do you get carbon dioxide into the plant and how do you then fix it so you can make it into sugars. 
And when you do that, you have to open some stomata or some pore to let CO2 in, but that lets water out. That causes transpiration. And so what they'll do is they do that at night. Okay, in CAM photosynthesis, they open their stomates at night and that minimizes transpiration loss, but they have to fix that CO2 through a complex biochemical process that's not the most efficient. But remember, you know, they're not limited by CO2, they're not limited by light, they're limited by water, so it minimizes water loss. Then they close their stomates during the day, and when that light hits them, then they use that carbon that's come in and been temporarily fixed overnight, they use that for the light reactions of photosynthesis. So they sort of break apart the two steps of photosynthesis. Almost all the trees we're learning in lab follow C3 photosynthesis, where those steps are much more closely linked. Okay, here's uh, another group of plants that you're going to find in arid regions. Um, so this one is Jarilla zygophilaceae laria spp. There are five species in the laria genus. Um, some are found in the Patagonia region in uh, South America. You may be familiar with creosote bushes in North America. So creosote is one of the five species of laria. And these are evergreen shrubs that have showy yellow flowers that you'll see in the spring. So the spring in South America is gonna be October, November. Um, and you know, typically the South American species are only gonna be five, 10 feet tall. They're not the tallest shrubs. Um, some of the species of Laria can make it up to 60 plus feet tall. Yeah. So what species was that again? We're not worrying about species. We're oh, just kind of- just said what that one was. I yeah, I, I believe this is the Patagonian species uh, that I got these photos from. So this, uh, I believe, I want to say it's Laria nubigenus, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but uh, they found one of these species of Laria um, actually in Southern California um, in the Mojave Desert, and, and they observed that it was growing in a circle. And so the thought was, you know, have people been planting this in a circle? What's going on here? Uh, some researchers started looking at it and carbon dating it, and the wood near the middle of the circle they found to be over 11,000 years old. Um, they call it the king clone, and so kind of the emerging theory there is it's one organism that's clonally propagated. So you've got some elevated subsurface water feature, and one shrub originally rooted down into that, and then it clonally propagated beside itself, but kind of equal distance from the water feature. And it just kind of kept going in a circle. And as individual shrubs die out, they end up getting replaced from the same rootstock. And so you end up with this clonal organism growing in this natural circle. Uh, people had nothing to do with it. So, so some interesting uh, ecology with these different species of Laria. So there's a couple example of species you find on some pretty dry sites. Uh, next, let's look at some different gymnosperms. Um, and like we saw with trees of Australia, we're going to see some more members of the air out Caryaceae, um, which is an exclusively southern hemisphere family of gymnosperms. But we're also going to start looking at the podocarps. We haven't really discussed them yet. Um, and remember, the podocarps are not quite as diverse as the Pinaceae, but they're pretty diverse. They're our second most diverse group of gymnosperms. And so our first up, you may have heard of, uh, this is monkey puzzle tree, air out Caryaceae. Araucaria araucana. Uh, this is the national tree of Chile. Um, it's been threatened in Chile due to the same reasons most of our trees globally have been threatened, just expansion of agriculture and urban areas. Um, so there's focus on protecting it now. Um, but it's a pretty hardy tree. If you look at it from far away, you wouldn't think it's a conifer. You'd be thinking something like a palm tree maybe, just in terms of the form that it has. But then as you get up close to it, it's got uh, these really prickly leaves. They've got kind of an arm spike right on the end there. So you don't want to mess with those. And then the cones, uh, again, are going to be pretty unfamiliar to those of us used to pine cone. Uh, it's distributed in central Chile, and it can get pretty big. It can reach uh, 40 meters in height, which is going to be about 130 feet. Uh, it can reach over three feet in DBH, so it can be a very large tree. Here you see it basically growing in a pile of rocks right by the ocean. So it can handle some pretty harsh environments. 
Uh, they've aged some of them and it can get up to about 1300 years in age. So it can live pretty long as well. Now the local name for this is Pahanias. Um, it's been used historically. Uh, people will eat the seeds on it roasted. And so it's been a food source for different peoples. Um, but why this is called monkey puzzle tree really has nothing to do with this tree and nothing to do with monkeys at all. Uh, the Spanish came over and started collecting some seeds on this. It eventually made its way back to Britain and people started planting it in gardens in Britain. Um, and it became kind of famous locally. It was an attraction because it was a rare. And then it got real popular in the Victorian era and people were spreading them all over the place. So they're now planted all over the world, including Britain. But I guess at some point somewhere in Britain, some fancy aristocrat looked at one of these and said, it would puzzle a monkey how it could get into that cone and eat the seeds, even though there's no monkeys in Chile eating seeds off these things. Uh, the seeds are actually dispersed by rodents and by birds primarily cattle now with all the agriculture going on. Um, so it has nothing to do with monkeys. So. Okay, next up we have Alerse. Also goes by Patagonian Cypress. And this is Cupress ACE Fitzroya Cupressoides. It's got a central Chilean distribution here. Chile has some really uh, strong forestry universities. So there's a lot of good research on trees coming out of Chile. And if you look at the trunk here, it may remind you of our bulb cypress. So it's got that reddish stringy vertical bark, very small woody cones, very short, stout needles on this tree. So morphologically, it's not gonna look like a pine or anything like that. And uh, Fitzroy has a pretty interesting sort of backstory. Uh, it is the oldest tree in South America. They've aged at least one of them in excess of 3,600 years old. And that actually makes it the second oldest tree on the planet behind bristlecone pine out in the mountains out west here in the United States. Um, so it's the second oldest tree we're aware of in the planet, not counting clonal ones, it's just individual stems making it to extreme age. It's also monotypic. So that means it's the last living member of the Fitzroy genus. Uh, there's no other similar species left anywhere on the planet. And it can get absolutely enormous in size. It can make it up to 220 plus feet in height, and it can get over 13 feet in DBH. So it can get really large, it can get really old. Um, it's you know unique from a taxonomic standpoint. So you can kind of think of this one as being parallel in some ways to our coastal redwood but there in South America. All right, here's another member of the Cupressaceae. This is Chilean cedar, Cupressaceae austrocedris chilensis. So chilensis is referring to the fact that it's found in Chile, central Chile. Austro again, just means Southern. Here it's talking about Southern hemisphere and cedrus is the true cedar genus. So it's just saying it's a Southern cedar is how they've named it there. When you look at it morphologically, it's got scale-like foliage, like many of our junipers will have here in Texas, similar form. But then the cones are a little unique. They kind of look like a duck's bill. So one of you will get to give a presentation on incense cedar found out in California, Western US. And our incense cedar here in North America has those same sort of duck bill type woody cones. Looking at Chilean cedar, uh, they've observed a decline. They've observed a lot of stands that kind of look like this, where you've got a lot of mortality in them. And so it's been a similar story with incense, or sorry, with uh, Chilean cedar to many sort of tree declines that have been observed throughout the world, where they started looking at this decline and they start finding immediate problems in these stands. They start finding some aphids. They look at the aphids. Yes, they're causing some mortality, but that doesn't seem to be really what's causing this whole issue with decline. They find some Phytophthora root rots. We have those here in East Texas. And they start looking at that. And yes, it, it's causing some of the issues they're observing, but it doesn't seem to be you know, fundamentally what's driving the issues here. And so then they start taking more of a community ecology approach, looking at the stand structure here. And what they observe is They've done things in Chile very similar to what we've done here in North America and throughout the world. They've suppressed fire and they've been suppressing fire for some time. 
And so the, the leading theory now is that these stands, once you remove fire as a routine natural disturbance in them, it allows them to become overstuffed. You end up with too many trees per acre that are too large because you've removed that source of mortality, especially in seedling size classes that would occur with repeated fire. And then you just end up with too many trees per acre. And once you have too many trees per acre, they're all fighting for resources too intensely, they get stressed, and then you end up with all these insect and disease issues as a result of that. Very similar in nature to how Southern pine beetle will attack pine stands here in the Southern US that are overstocked, they have too many trees per acre. And so it's a very similar story to what we've seen here in the US. And so there's a smoky bear button in Spanish for you. Okay, let's look at the podocarps. So this first one is Podocarpus nubigenus. Um, and one name for it is Pino amarillo, which means yellow pine in Spanish. Also goes by Manio. Uh, the different podocarp species are popular ornamentals here uh, in East Texas. Um, so if you head out of our forestry building right here and go right across that crosswalk towards the medical center, right on the corner of the medical center is a, I don't know, head high shrub that looks pretty identical to the photos I'm showing you right here. Looking at it, you know, if I had walked you up there in the lab and said, what is this? Everyone probably would have thought it was an angiosperm but it's actually a gymnosperm. And so these podocarps are gymnosperms, but you would never know that looking at them. They have broad leaves. So you can think of these kind of in, in size and shape as being very similar to willow oak, uh, but they're evergreen. So they're thicker, they're more leathery. Uh, some of them are dioecious, some of them are monoecious, uh, but they'll get pollen cones that look very much like catkins. And so it looks like an angiosperm flower. And then they don't have anything we would describe as a cone on it. You look at them and they sure look like they have fruit. And so the question is, if they have fruit, how can it be a gymnosperm? Well, here's what's going on. Remember, for it to be a fruit, that fruit is a ripened ovary. That structure that's doing the same thing as a fruit, allowing wildlife to disperse the seed, it's not a ripened ovary. Instead, it's a series of fused and ripened cone scales. So it's a vegetative tissue that is serving the same function as a fruit. So it looks like a fruit, it works like a fruit, but just based on the tissues it derives from, it's not a fruit, which is why this is still a gymnosperm, even though it appears to have fruit. Um, so these, these seeds will be dispersed by wildlife, um, allowing Pinot Amarillo to spread throughout the landscape. Pinot Amarillo um, is what we call a um, austral paired species. Um, and so we're gonna see this in a number of different tax. I'll show it to you again with some uh, Southern beaches. Uh, but basically I've, I've been using this slide for years. This was the best diagram I could find that would illustrate the point. And for years I was telling people if you ignore the fact that it includes dinosaurs and is in German, the point is the same. We had a student a few years ago named Ellert Rupenhill, we called him Dutch. And he informed me this is actually Dutch, not German. But, but the point is still the same. Um, you used to have all the southern continents together as one large supercontinent. And you had species like Pinot Amarillo that may have had a range map that spanned multiple of what are now separate continents. And then plate tectonics occurred over millions of years. These continents spread to their current positions, separated by thousands of miles of ocean. And the, the individuals that were left, the populations that were left on a couple different continents, then were able to develop different mutations and eventually separate to the point that they formed two different species. So you'll actually find species in Australia, South America, some islands in the South Pacific, and they look very similar to one another, but they're separate species. So that mode of speciation is called allopatric speciation. Um, so Pinot Amarillo is actually paired with Podocarpus totara, um, and totara, I believe, is going to be found um, in South Africa, but completely different species, looks very, very similar to Podocarpus nubigenus. Uh, Podocarpus nubigenus is the southernmost uh, extant of these podocarps, so it's the most cold tolerant of these, early successional, and handle those high light environments. 
Here's another gymnosperm group you would never think was a gymnosperm. Uh, so here's C grape, not an actual grape. This is Ephedraceae, Ephedra Brianna. And it's the same idea. It appears to have a fruit, but that's not a ripened ovary. That comes from a modified vegetative tissue. And so it, it is indeed a gymnosperm. Uh, so these different ephedra species, we do have some of these in the desert southwest in the United States. Uh, you can see they're not used for timber. They don't get that big. They're going to be a small shrub found out in the desert, uh, but they are used for their chemistry. So the ephedra species produce compounds called ephedrine, um, and that's going to be a stimulant. And so it's used medicinally uh, pretty frequently. It's one of the ingredients that you'll find in methamphetamines. And so we've synthesized this now, and that's what you would call pseudoephedrine, right? And so that's what you find in pseudofed that'll help clear up your head cold. So not used for timber, but they are used medicinally. Okay, so that was the gymnosperms. Next up, let's look at some different angiosperms and some kind of different groups just to highlight a few. And so I want to look at the southern beaches first, the Nothophagus. Uh, during a normal semester without all the weather delays, we would be doing week seven of lab out at Tonkawa right now where we learn American beach. Uh, and American beach honestly looks very similar to the southern beaches. You can see leaves of a number of different taxa there. You can see that scale bar at two centimeters. So that's just shy of an inch. So the largest one, Rowley Beach here, has a leaf uh, that's going to be about three inches long. Uh, that's going to be kind of similar in size to the American beach we'll learn later this semester in lab. Um, they have different leaf margins they're showing you here. Um, our American beach is going to have leaf margins that are serrated, where these very parallel veins each end in a tooth. And so that's going to be very similar to this leaf margin right here that you see. And so here's the, the same concept we just saw with uh, Podocarpus nubigenus and Podocarpus totara, where if you look at the range map, they span Chile to New Zealand to Australia to Papua New Guinea. And these all probably derive from one or more species that were separated and has, have then speciated into even more species. So the Nothophagaceae, here's one of those species. This is Rowley Beach, Nothophagaceae, Nothophagus alpina. And it, it's uncanny. Uh, this is the capsule that would hold a few nuts. And so that's gonna be the fruit on these trees. And if you got the fruit from an American beach and you held it right up here to this slide, they look identical. Okay, you have the exact same capsule-like structure that's holding um, a couple kind of triangular pyramidal uh, small nuts back to back. And so the fruit is uncannily similar, same size, same look, everything's very similar about it. Nothophagus alpina, um, you've got alpine right in the name. It's the most cold tolerant of the Southern beaches Can reach up to the higher elevations. Um, it's one of the larger Southern beaches. Um, it can actually reach 50 meters in height. And so that's going to be 160-ish feet. Uh, so it can get pretty large. So the southern beaches are used for timber species um, in some of these regions where they grow. Okay, next up, I want to look at the mallow family, which is the Malvaceae. So we're just hitting a few highlights here. Yeah, it looks exactly like that. What's that? Yeah, American Beach has a fruit that looks just like this. Yeah, it's uncannily similar. Okay, so in the mallow family, let's look at a few members. Uh, we will get wax mallow in lab later this semester, so that's going to be a North American member, but it's it's small. It's like shoulder height. Um, some of these are quite large. This is Kapok tree. Malvaceae, Seba, and Pandra. And Kapok has an interesting range map. You can find it in South America, you can find it in Central America, and you can also find it in Africa. Um, so it's actually dispersed on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the largest one uh, that we're aware of is in Costa Rica. 80 meters tall is going to be about 260 feet. Uh, so it's an absolutely enormous tree. 
And then what you really notice about them, um, it, it's not a tree hugger's friend. Um, it's even more aggressively prickly uh, than the Hercules Club and Devil's Walking Stick that we're going to see in lab this week. Its fruit um, is going to be this large capsule, and the capsule is full of these waxy, cottony fibers that aid in dispersing the seed. Uh, but those waxy, cottony fibers have been used by a lot of different indigenous peoples for a lot of different purposes. Um, they've been woven into fabrics, and because of the waxy coating to it, those fabrics will tend to shed water, uh, which can be helpful in some of these regions where it rains a lot. And then more of, I guess, a specialty use, um, that fiber has been used as wadding in blow darts uh, that different indigenous peoples have used uh, for hunting. And so it's been used popularly for that. Now, if you look at this insanely aggressively prickly bark, no one's 100% sure why they have that, uh, but the leading theory is uh, to avoid herbivory by sloths. Um, and so sloths, of course, notoriously slow, which means they have a slow metabolism. Half the animal will be undigested plant matter at any given point in time. So that's kind of gross when you think about it. Uh, but because they move very slowly, basically one or more sloths will get up into a tree. Once they're up in there, they just kind of defoliate that whole tree before moving on. So the theory is that, you know, these trees have developed these prickly trunks and branches to try and dissuade herbivory by sloths in this region. Okay, next up is a tree everybody's probably heard of, but you probably never really thought of as a tree out in the forest, right? So many people have heard of balsa wood or used balsa wood for craft projects, and it comes from the balsa tree, which is Malvaceae uh, ochroma pyrimidale. Per and so when you look at balsa trees, uh, they have insane growth rates. A seven-year-old stand can be 100 feet tall. So they can grow incredibly rapidly. And that rapid growth rate is linked into another of their important features, uh, which we'll talk about here in a moment. In terms of identification, many members of the Malvasi family have leaves shaped very much like this. I could have put up, put up a photo of a wax mallow leaf, the species we're gonna learn in lab later this semester, and it would look pretty much identical to that. Um, so those rounded indented leaf base there with a couple main lobes, three main lobes, that's distinct. And like we saw in Kapok tree, you're getting those cottony filaments in there that are going to help disperse the seed. Now, in terms of what balsa tree is known for, because of that really rapid growth rate, um, it gets these really big cells and produces wood that is incredibly light and yet strong. And so you've got this really light, really strong wood. Here you see a nerdy engineer building a model bridge out of it there. Um, but it's been used historically for all sorts of purposes. You can go buy blocks or sheets of balsa wood in craft stores. People use them to make little wood model airplanes. Uh, but during World War II, metals were short due to the war effort uh, across the globe. And so the, the British were having trouble sourcing aluminum and so what they did instead is they started building some wooden aircraft. And so they built a, a famous uh, fighter plane called the Mosquito. And it was actually sheets of balsa wood stuck in between sheets of birch wood. Um, and that's what they used for the aircraft and it was pretty successful. Um, so this wood has actually been used in aircraft. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Cinchona rubiaceae. Cinchona, and we'll just go SPP. There's a few different species. We won't worry about it too much, uh, but you tend to find them in Northwestern South America and into Central America as well. Um, when you look at the morphology, uh, you can see the opposite leaf arrangement, some nice showy flowers on these trees. Uh, but what these trees are known for, these trees have really done a lot uh, to alter the course of modern world history. Uh, even though you may have never heard of them. They produce a uh, compound, an alkaloid, which is called quinine. And uh, what people found is that quinine will actually serve as a treatment for malaria, um, which is uh, one of the most pervasive diseases across some regions of the world. And so this was discovered a long time ago. 
Um, so some Jesuits brought it back uh, from South America as early as the 1600s, and they brought it back to Rome. And uh, there were a bunch of swamps around Rome. They were having issues with outbreaks of malaria there, which of course is a mosquito-borne disease. And so they brought it in and it was helping uh, cure folks uh, from those malaria outbreaks. But of course, the, the Jesuits are Catholics. Um, it turns out uh, that Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector of England, um, who was a Protestant, uh, he, he caught malaria in the mid 1600s. And uh, because it was the Catholics that had brought this compound back, he decided that you know it was from the devil. Since they were using it, he wasn't gonna take it and he died of malaria. So. Uh, who knows how history could have been changed if he'd been willing to take that medicine. Malaria is uh, really pervasive across Africa. Um, so here you see a map of Africa from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, basically showing you how European colonists broke it up into all these different colonies. So you've got Belgium in pink, Britain in orange, France in blue, Germany in this pale green. And so you can see they divided up the continent they may not have been able to do that uh, without this tree, Cinchona, uh, because with malaria, they just wouldn't have made much headway uh, without a treatment for it. Um, they ended up, you know, it became difficult to go to South America to get all the quinine that they needed. So they actually started establishing Cinchona plantations in India um, in the mid 1800s um, and made it into a commercial product. Um, Cinchona being used to produce quinine continued into World War II, and so you had U.S. propaganda posters, uh, don't be a dummy, avoid malaria in the uh, African theater, and then they have, you know, mosquitoes coming in with bayonets, and it wasn't until the, towards the end of the war, the late 1940s, or sorry, the mid-1940s, 1944 there, that they finally figured out how to synthesize this in a lab. And so now there's no demand for it from the trees, the, the quinine you may get before you travel uh, to a part of the world where malaria is an issue, uh, that's gonna come from a, a lab now. So. Okay, uh, next up we have ambu, phytolacaceae, phytolaca dioica. Um, so is anyone familiar with uh, pokeweed here in the Southern US, poke salad? Anybody heard of that? Um, it's a herbaceous plant that makes it to about six feet tall, and you'll notice it in the fall because it has like bright, angry, purplish red stems on it uh, that makes it real obvious. Um, but this is the same family and genus. Uh, ambu is kind of an interesting tree. It grows in the pampas region of Argentina, which is primarily a grassland region, and it's one of the few trees found in that area. Um, this photo, you can kind of see a bench back in here. This photo is taken in a botanical garden, so it's not where it would be found uh, naturally. But as one of the few trees in this primarily grassland region, um, it's been used for a long time, basically as people were herding cattle and other livestock. This is where the livestock would seek shade. This is where the people herding the animals uh, would seek shade. Um, it doesn't have to get that tall. It's not very woody. And so you can almost take a butter knife and carve into this thing. It's a, it's a really, really soft woody species. But because it's one of the few trees in that region, it's taken the name the Lighthouse of the Pampas just because uh, it's one of the few trees. You can see it from far away. Okay, here's Spanish cedar, which has nothing to do with the cedar. Uh, Meliaceae cedrella odorata. And this is gonna kind of look a little bit like our black walnut. You can see those pinnately compound, even pinnately compound leaves there, which are pretty obvious. Um, this is an interesting South American species. Um, it's got a lot of chemical properties in the woods that makes it resistant to rot, resistant to termite, and uh, that aroma to the wood has led this to be kind of a, a popular specialty product. It's been used in the necks of some guitars, it's been used to make humidors, which you'll store cigars in. Um, I've even seen recent ads where people are uh, getting more and more into um, aging beer on wood and trying to get the flavors of the wood into the beer. And this is one species uh, that they've been experimenting with there. So kind of some interesting modern uses to it. Okay, so here's uh, Canelo, Winter ACE, Drimmy's Winter Eye. 
And so as you look at this tree, where would you think the family name and the specific epithet might derive from? It's got winter in it, right? So you might guess, oh, maybe this thing flowers in winter or something like that. You would think it would have to do with the season, um, but it actually doesn't. So um, as uh, Drake and his group were circumnavigating or attempting to circumnavigate the world um, in the late 1500s, uh, one of the other ships with him was captained by a man named Winter. So this is named after Captain Winter. But basically, as they tried to circumnavigate the world before they knew much about doing that or human health, uh, they all started getting sick. They didn't know why they were getting sick. So they finally came aground um, in Patagonia and uh, Drake sent Winter Inland and said, find us something that's gonna cure why we're all getting sick. So they had no idea what was wrong with them, but he went in, he found this tree after talking with some folks that were already there. And it turned out they were sick just because they weren't getting enough vitamin C. They had a vitamin C deficiency, they were getting scurvy. And so this tree happens to have a lot of vitamin C, ascorbic acid um, in the bark. So they started bringing this back, eating this, Kind of tasted peppery too their food was terrible so that wasn't a bad thing and uh this cured their scurvy and it ended up they brought it back to um, europe and it actually became one of the first sort of commercially traded sources of vitamin c uh, that they started using for a period there to help them on these long voyages uh, avoid this basic nutrient um, that's obviously not a common use for it anymore. Um, nowadays, uh, Canelo is used uh, as a wood product to make musical instruments. Um, and so it has some other specialty uses there. All right, here's Brazilian pepper, Anacardiaceae shinus terebinthifolius. And so this is clearly not a map of South America. Um, Brazilian pepper, you can see from the photo there, it's a pretty shrub. It's got nice, pretty green leaves and it's got real attractive bright red fruits. And so we brought this in from South America uh, into Florida, Texas, Louisiana. We planted it as an ornamental and oops, um, it's now a pretty bad, aggressive, invasive species. Uh, it can't handle cold too well. And so you can see that's really shaping where it's found in the US, it's gonna be south to central Florida. There's some areas where, you know, South Florida is pretty flat. You don't have much in the way of elevation, but sort of in this region right here, central South Florida, they have some, you know, ridges may only be a few feet high, but that's where you were finding, you know, many of the trees here in South Florida. And those ridges are now pretty heavily covered in shyness. And so it's replacing a lot of native flora there. Um, in Texas, you're seeing this on Matagorda Island, other areas like that. So some of you, depending on where you go in your career, may end up running across this. So uh, it's an invasive species of pretty significant concern. Okay, so here's our last tree. Uh, this is Brazil wood, Fabaceae sesalpina echinata. Um, it's been called sesalpina since the 1700s, but uh, I think they've recently changed it to Para Brasilia or something like that um, as of maybe three, four years ago. Um, but as you look at this tree, it's got some similar features to other species we've already seen. So it's got this uh, real prickly bark on there, kind of like we saw on Kapok tree, not quite as aggressive. You'd be able to identify the legumes pretty easily compared to those we're already familiar with because it's a legume, sure, but it looks like a cactus pad, right? It's got all those prickles coming off the lagoon, which we haven't seen for sure. That's the echinata. Remember, echinata means spiny. So that's referring to the lagoon, the bark there. It's got real nice showy yellow flowers. Uh, but the, the real interesting thing about Brazil wood, how would you guess uh, it got its name? How would you name this tree Brazil wood? You find it in Brazil, right? That's the obvious thing. It turns out the story is actually backwards from so Brazil, the fifth, fifth largest country on the planet was named after this tree and not the other way around. Um, so in Brazil, they speak Portuguese uh, primarily. And so uh, basically what happened um, in the you know, 13, 14, 1500s um, in Italy and other areas of Europe, natural dyes were difficult to come by. There were no synthetic dyes. And so red was apparently a color that people liked that was more difficult to come by. 
And so there were some trees they were able to get red dyes from, we'll go over some in future lectures, and they were pulling them out of Asia and the trade routes were long and complex, so it, it was expensive. And then some uh, Portuguese arrived in um, the region that's now Brazil around 1500 and they saw all the people that were already there and you know they've got bright red clothing on and you know they're, they're wearing what looked like to the Europeans very expensive clothes and it's because they were able to extract a red dye from this tree. And so for years uh, the Portuguese started bringing this back to Europe, trading this, it went for really high value, they harvested a lot of it, the Dutch got into it in the 1600s, and there was this massive trade around this. Uh, there were pirates in the region that were stealing these logs being shipped back to Europe. Uh, but basically, because of this red dye, uh, the thinking went that people were saying, oh, this burns like an ember. Burns like an ember. And the Portuguese word for an ember um, is kind of like Brazil, but eventually got kind of distorted into Brazil. And so they named, you know, this tree Brazil would basically in Portuguese, and that ended up giving the whole country its name. Well, you come to modern day and they eventually started synthesizing red dyes. So that kind of killed the trade uh, in this tree. But then what they figured out in the 1800s is this tree has fantastic wood also. And it was great for bows, for cellos and violins. So that sort of created another rush harvesting this species. And uh, as of today, there's only about 2,000 of them left out in the wild. It's endangered. They are planted ornamentally, so hopefully we're not going to lose the species. Uh, but it's now illegal to harvest them in Brazil. So, so there's our last tree from the, the day. And it's the, the tree that led to the name of the country that covers about half the continent of South America.